Next up is uh, Susanna French. She's going to tell us about the Medellino program. All right. So I'm fortunate to go after David because he's explained a lot of the sort of background that's very similar to metagenomes. And of course, the metagenome program is very dependent on the microbial genome program for a, for a lot of things. And um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit today about, um, about our, the metagenomics research that we're doing and how we handle metagenomes and how that differs from the microbial genome. Um, so you may or may not know that JGI has become something of a hub of metagenomics research, kind of like the microbial um, research, and this is a timeline put together by, by David Gilbert and um, Phil Hugenholtz and a couple of other people showing some of the major shotgun, um, shotgun metagenomic studies over the last uh, several years. And you can see the ones in green are the ones that the JGI did, did a significant amount of the sequencing. To the, um, and so especially in the last few years, we've really been publishing quite a few large metagenome studies, and uh, we continue to expand this program. Um, from being sort of an offshoot of the microbial program to really being something you know of its own entity. And so in my talk, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what metagenomics is and what we do at the JGI, our metagenome portfolio, and some things about you know the, the data analysis. And um, I was hoping to have time for a scientific example at the end. We'll see if that's actually a feasible. I may end up filling up the time with just the nuts and bolts. But since I'm a scientist, I always like to give a little science talk, too. Um, so why do metagenomics? You know, David just talked about our microbial sequencing capacity. We can do a huge number of microbial isolates. Like, why not just do those? They're a lot easier. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. And one is that there's studies have shown that there's this vast, uncultivated phylogenetic diversity. And I imagine people have heard of this from 16S sequencing, um, that in virtually any environment you look at, the things that you can cultivate from that environment aren't usually the major players in that environment. And so it's very difficult to actually uh, isolate the organisms that are of greatest interest there. And so if you're, whether you're looking at you know, ecologic, ecological processes or trying to find pharmacologically valuable compounds or industrially useful enzymes, you'd essentially be foolish to focus on this small fraction of microbes that we already have growing in culture. You really need to look at you know, the full range of microbes and really one of the only ways of doing that is through metagenomics. So this is a slide that I showed in last year's JGI 101, and I call it Metagenome Sequencing 2008 because things are changing so rapidly. And at the time, I said we basically had three major metagenome projects, and or types of projects, and um, by far the most conceptually simple was this shotgun sequencing. And so they all fundamentally start with just a microbial community. You isolate DNA directly from the community, and in this case, you just sequence it. And most of what we did was actually we cloned and sequenced it by Sanger and generated a whole bunch of data that we could then you know, do a variety of things with. Some other um, types of metagenome-like sequencing that also start with this environmental DNA is 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, which came up briefly here, um, which is good for finding out sort of the phylo phylogenetic members of a community. Um, we still do quite a lot of 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. We, we build libraries for bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes from actually all of our metagenome projects. Um, another kind of niche area is large insert clone cert sequencing, um, often because it can be so difficult to assemble um, straight metagenome shotgun data. People prefer to focus on a set of large clones like phosmid clones that contain genes of interest that are found by end sequencing or by some kind of screening or something. And then they can kind of look at the particular genes that they're interested in without getting into the whole morass of the whole community. And so we've done these all by Sanger up until relatively recently. We've had these Sanger PCR clone libraries, usually short insert libraries were the bulk of our shotgun sequencing. And then we would do phosmid subclone sequencing, which also these phosmids, the full inserts would be sequenced by shotgunning those individual phosmids and cloning them into Sanger libraries. 2009, this has all changed. Um, now we have a protocol for doing these, um, these shorter pyrotag reads on the 454. It generates at least an order of magnitude more data than we generally generated with those Sanger clone libraries. Um, we're directing a lot of our shotgun sequencing to the 454 titanium platform. Now that um, 454 titanium, we're easily getting 350 to 450 base pair reads on metagenomic projects. Um, which is really bringing us to something comparable to what we were getting by Sanger, which was something like a 700 base pair read. Um, and we're working on pool and phosmid sequencing by pooling and sequencing on the 454 rather than, um, than these individual shotgun subclone libraries, which were a huge um, 
labor um, intensive type of project and one that you know we often talked about whether we should really even keep doing them because they were so problematic for production, sequencing a single plate of shotgun clones from a Fosmid. Um, moreover, we are expanding our metagenome portfolio beyond just shotgun metagenomics and single clone sequencing. And this is a slide that um, Phil Hugenholtz and Falk Wernicke put together. And it shows a, a ton of information in this slide, but it shows down here is basically the standard metagenomics. You take your microbial community, you extract DNA, and you sequence it. But now we're um, branching out into in a couple, in, in really three different directions. One is looking downstream at the RNA and the protein that are expressed, taking that RNA and um, sequencing it um, directly for metatranscriptomics. Metaproteomics, we don't do at the JGI, but we do have collaborations to do it. Um, so I think I have some of these. So the 454 titanium is really the workhorse for both metagenome sequencing and this metatranscriptomic sequencing, which is still, we're still really working out the kinks in the metatranscriptomics, but I think it's going to be a really promising area. And it may also depend on the Illumina platform, which isn't shown up here. Um, for metaproteomics, you can do things like a mass spec. Um, and then going out in this direction, we're looking at targeted metagenomics. Instead of looking at an entire community present someplace, maybe there's a specific subset you're interested in. And there are different ways of getting at it. One of those is um, something like flow sorting some cells. You can get an enriched population, and then you can take that, extract your DNA, maybe even extract your RNA or your protein. This is something that's really undone so far. That's why it's labeled here, this un unexplored territory. Um, or you can even pick out single cells and amplify them with MDA and do DNA sequencing. Um, again, we, RNA and proteins are uh, not something that we have explored yet on the single cell level, but we really are, are um, successfully sequencing um, large fractions of single cell genomes by uh, amplification and, uh, and, and high throughput sequencing. And finally, we're in expanding into more and more um, samples, you know, instead of looking at one community, look at that community over time, across space, et cetera. And I think that um, you know, you've heard a little bit about the new technology and stuff. Another real development in parallel with the new sequencing technologies is a real um, parallelization of, um, of library preparation and stuff, which has really opened the horizon because libraries have been a really limiting step for a lot of our projects. And so this just shows flow sorting, single cell manipula micro manipulation is uh, an in-house uh, you know, uh, capability that we have now. And so we're really going out in a lot of different directions. We have a lot of different kinds of microbial uh, community projects. And our real, um, our analysis central is IMGM, which, you know, is the workshop going on across the hall. We are working very hard to make it such that every type of data that we generate can be converged into IMGM. So far, again, you know, most of the projects have been of this just sort of microbial community DNA. Um, they definitely have capabilities for dealing with that. Um, but they are really working on um, being able to deal with all these different kinds of data. So what are we actually using our metagenome sequencing for? Um, so there are three DOE mission areas, um, the bioenergy and carbon cycling bioremediation. These are some photos of various uh, aspects of projects that we have going on now. Um, and we have, you know, really a, a lot of projects in all these areas. Uh, a big emphasis is bioenergy and biofuels. And one of the reasons for that is that a major limiting uh, step in producing fuels from, say, like, cellulosic material is actually breaking that material down into its component sugars before you can ferment it into ethanol or some other kind of fuel. And uh, we look to nature saying, you know, clearly there's already mechanisms in place for breaking these things down. We're not wading in a sea of wood and grass. Somehow this is all getting broken down out in nature and it absolutely happens in a lot of different ways. And so some, um, a surprising amount of the, of the cellulosic material gets processed through um, insects like termites. Um, there are also um, ruminants that can, you know, eat and digest lignus and cellulosic material. Um, and this has evolved, this capability has evolved, it, you know, throughout the phylogenetic tree. There are a lot of other insects that can actually eat wood or leaves or grass. There are other mammals. Um, there's even a bird called the hoitsen or the stink bird that eats leaves and is able to ferment even though it's, you know, very small bird. It's really very different from something like a cow, which has this gigantic um, fermentation compartment. And, the, and there's even mollusks called shipworms that actually uh, bore, bore into ships and can cause a lot of damage, and they eat this uh, wood material too. And to a one, all of these animals actually rely on the microbial communities in their guts to break down that ligocellulosic material. Very, none of them really are the, some of them may p potentially express some enzymes that break it down, but none of them could do it without their microbial symbionts. 
And there are also free living communities that can break down uh, lignocellulosic material, things like compost or just decomposing wood chips. And these are actually all things that we are studying with metagenomic projects at the JGI now, among I think even some others. Um, so what do we do once we have the data? What are the kinds of things that we're exploring here? And sometimes we're just doing things like looking for new enzymes, like glycosyl hydrolases are the enzymes that break down um, polymers like cellulose. Um, this is actually a screenshot from IMG showing the different PFAM glycosyl hydrolase families. I couldn't even fit them all on the screen, but you can see this is one of our lignocellulose degrading communities and virtually every known glycosyl hydrolase is represented in that genome. This gives a count of genes. And some of them, there's you know, an extraordinary number. Here's 64 different um, enzymes of this family and you know, a whole bunch of different ones. And so it's really a, a surprising gold mine of novel enzymes. Um, another thing you can do with metagenome data is actually look at population heterogeneity. This is a screenshot from CONSED showing a consensus genome sequence. And normally when you look at all the reads in a genome project, you'd want to make sure that all the reads agreed, you know, that this was the consensus sequence. But when you're looking at a population, there'll be reads that differ. And you can see these red bases are differences from the consensus. And instead of being sequencing mistakes, these are actually real haplotypes within the community. You can see these two reads have a totally distinct haplotype from the other ones in here. And, um, that can really be very characteristic of different types of communities, the level of heterogeneity that you see. Um, we can also use this to characterize novel organisms. As I said, you know, one of the only ways to study uncultivated organisms is by metagenomics. And this is a contig formed out of a bioreactor sample that we had that has a big uh, ribosomal RNA operon from an OP5, which is a totally uncultivated phylum and a whole set of other enzymes that, are, that belong to this organism and that might tell us something about what it can actually do, you know, the first genomic data from these sort of, uh, sort of organisms. So, um, so there's a lot of directions we can go with metagenomes and we have, you know, this huge portfolio of projects. And so I thought I'd go into, kind of step back a little and say, well, how are these projects handled differently from other types of, you know, isolate genome projects? Um, how do we determine sequence all allocation? Because that's actually a really big question, and it's still, you know, something in flux a bit. But um, but we do have some controls in place to try to determine this. And you know, how do we actually analyze the data? Um, so this is another one of my 2008-2009 breakdowns because we're trying to switch platforms on all of these things. Conventionally, with all metagenome projects for which we receive DNA, we would always build a, a full panel of ribosomal libraries. We'd use three sets of primers, bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, and do anything that amplified. We'd clone it, sequence 1384 well plate. Um, at the same time, <coughs> we'd create a short insert library. Um, again, Sanger Library and sequence about 2384 well plates, which is about 10 megabases. And then all of that would um, sort of converge into a QC analysis, which essentially um, has been mostly me um, up until recently. And, um, and so I try to look at, look at all that data on the community, how it's assembling, et cetera, and say, you know, is this what was expected? You know, presumably when someone sends in a project, they have some idea what they, what they thought was going to be in there. Um, is the library high quality, which is a question that we always ask of all of our projects. Um, and you know, will sequencing this library actually allow us to achieve the scientific goals that were you set out in the proposal? And so now in 2009, we have of course the same questions. We're trying to now redo our QC so that we do these 16S um, SSU pyrotags on 454, get something more like 10,000 reads as opposed to 384, um, and send the DNA to uh, the 454 titanium for a quarter run, which is about 100 megabases, so an order of magnitude more than we were getting from our QC um, on Sanger. And then just do the same kind of QC analysis. Um, Things like read length and pass rate of the library tell us a lot just about whether you know, that library worked out and whether it's going to be a good thing to sequence. Um, that's, again, something common to all libraries that we sequence. Um, this is just a report on the um, ribosomal sequencing showing you know, what, how, many, how these things clustered and, and what phylogenetic groups they were assigned to so I can get an idea whether it's consistent. A lot of these communities have previously had 16S sequencing done, so it's a good you know, cross-reference tool. Um, and the short insert libraries, there's a number of things we look at, and there's a useful tool called um, Megan that will tell, give us a phylogenetic breakdown of all the blast hits. Um, tries to give some kind of uh, make some kind of guess at how deeply it can resolve that, 
And um, this also will tell us, I, it can in fact be more informative than the 16S library. Um, so this is just an example actually from a hot spring, so I've been working on a lot of those lately. And um, you can see that you know, there's a big group of Sulfalobus hits, and so the first question is always, well, is there you know, one dominant species here? There's really not a whole lot else showing up in the rest of this phylogenetic tree. You've got thousands of reeds in this Sulfalobus branch. And maybe we have a pretty homogeneous community here. Um, and so one thing you can do is then take all those hits and look at the GC content. Um, you can also look at higher level resolution like oligonucleotides, but often that's not necessary. And when you look at this one, you can see clearly there are two completely different GC peaks. Um, even as you go through the phylogenetic tree, if you take all the reads, you've got a bimodal distribution. If you just go into this family, sulfalobaceae, and the genus level, even the species level, you still always have these two peaks. So clearly, in this case, there's more than one dominant population, and that's really informative to know. We're not looking at a really homogeneous thing. We're looking at at least two organisms here, possibly more, um, based on that analysis. Um, similarly, this is just another example from a different hot spring. You have a bunch of hits here to this sulfury hydrogenibium, but you have a lot of other things on that same kind of branch. And you'd say, well, you know, there's these other family members. And, you know, are those just kind of overflow? Or again, is this, you know, is this a homogeneous community? Is this something that there's distinct branches? Here, when you actually plot those, you can see that that, that one genus has a very coherent GC peak, whereas these other, um, other family members clearly have a different distribution. There's this nice thermos <coughs> population that comes out up here. And so, again, based on this, we can say most of this peak is probably this dominant organism. This is the one that's probably going to come out of our you know, assemblies, and these other ones you know, are going to be in a separate, um, really separate you know, phylogenetic category. So we also assemble the red is polyphosphate accumulating organisms. They form these kind of dense flocks, which is why they settle out so nicely. And they call this organism um, Candidatus accumulobacter phosphatus, or CAP. However, all attempts to get that organism in pure culture were unsuccessful. They could get it highly enriched in bioreactors, but they couldn't get it in pure culture. And so it seemed like a plum metagenomic project. They could get these bioreactors to some 80, 90% of the target organism. So when they first started this project, they got high quality DNA from the, uh, from the bioreactor, which was a good source of DNA. They were able to get a lot. Um, they did about 72 megabases of sequencing and they assembled it and they had you know, a whole bunch of contigs and a bunch of singlets and they said, um, you know, and so they figured, well, probably most of this is polyphosphate accumulating organisms. And um, I think actually at this point, they, they really had wanted to get a finished genome out of this metagenome. And I think they approached the finishing group and said, you know, well, what can you do with this? And the finishing group said, you know, we can't do anything with this. There's all kinds of, you know, there's a million different things in there. We don't know what to do with it. Um, but so they, they decided, well, we'll have to, you know, work with what we have for now. And the first question was, well, which things are actually polyphosphate accumulating organisms and which things are all those other members of the community? And so there are tools that can actually use um, use information from marker gene containing contigs to train a model on the sequence composition and then determine you know, which contigs look, have a similar sequence composition to the ones that you know have the marker genes that you're looking at, your 16S RNA or your ribosomal proteins or things that you feel pretty sure are from your target organism. So they use this tool called Phylopithia and they took all their contigs and they fed it in and they said, okay, now we have a set of contigs that is that we say is Candidatus accumulobacter phosphatus and a bunch of contigs that we say aren't. And they annotated those and they did some metabolic reconstruction. They published this in 2006 and they found out all kinds of interesting things about these organisms. They found a ton of phosphate transporters, not too surprisingly. I think they found a novel um, quinone reductase or something that really helped explain some of the electron balance in the whole process. And um, it really you know, learned a lot about these organisms, but they still said, uh, here's the phosphate transporters, yeah, the quinol reductase. Um, but they still weren't happy with that. They still wanted their finished genome. And so the, the finishing group, including Ala Lapidus and Steve Lowry said, well, if you have this set of contigs that you really know is the right organism, maybe you know, we can work with that set of DNA and actually start you know, doing some genome improvement on it. So actually what they did seemed a little um, counterintuitive. They actually took all those contigs and then they just broke them all back apart into the reads that went into those contigs. And then they reassembled and even just that process they pulled in some other data that looked like it probably belonged, like the paired reads from these things. And um, they got a better assembly just by kind of going through that process, getting rid of all the chaff and kind of focusing on the good stuff. 
Um, they did um, some 454 sequencing, which had come online, which really helps fills in, fill in gaps in the assemblies. And just from that, they already got a genome that was really in just a few pieces. They got some complete plasmids out of that. And with some finishing efforts, some extra, extra um, sequencing you know, to fill in those gaps, they actually got a completely closed um, poly, uh, you know, candidatus, accumul candidatus accumulobacter phosphatus genome. It's now finished to that finishing um, you know, standard of a fully closed genome. And they're working on that. Um, I think that's still in publication now. Um, so basically, the conclusions are that we were able, they were able to get significant assembly. They were actually able to do metabolic construction based on that. But moreover, once, um, once they'd done this additional finishing work, they were really able to get a complete genome from this metagenome sample. And we actually have ongoing projects to study these um, type of reactors doing metatranscriptomics, studying a, a different strain of accumulobacter phosphatus. And um, it's really been a, a fruitful project in a lot of ways. Um, so overall, my summary, um, right at 11, is that um, you know, the choice of metagenomic sequencing process is complex and it depends on the goals, the complexity of the community, and a number of factors. This is always, you know, even though we, we like collaborators to propose something you know, in their proposal, what they want to do, we always work back and forth with them uh, you know, between what our capabilities are, what they want, and you know, what's really going to get them an optimal product. Um, we have these metagenome specific quality controls and assembly and annotation protocols and that really most of the analysis is done in IMGM. Um, so finally, the acknowledgments. Um, Phil Hugenholtz is the head of our metagenome program, and he and I have been working closely on really, um, really describing this as its own independent entity from the microbial program. Um, Stephanie Malfatti um, is working quite a bit on the metagenome QCs and assemblies. Um, Carrie Berry is the project manager for all the uh, metagenome projects, so she's a key contact at the JGI. And then the EBPR sledge project was um, from Phil Hugenholtz's lab. Hector Garcia Martin was the main uh, postdoc working on that, and then this finishing group, and Alice McCarty does the Phylopithia binning. And I think that's it. Yeah, so, so, uh, Is there any way to tell what in the single cell approach to tell what you're in the sequence before you sequence in terms of the next um, Or is it just a uh, crapshoot? I mean, trying to figure out what organism you have before you sequence it. Yeah. Um, I think that um, for the micro manipulation, often they, what they do is, you know, I mean, you, in theory, you could choose things based on morphology, but I think that can be difficult. They'd actually sort out a, a large number of cells, go ahead and do the amplification, and then do 16F sequencing. Um, you know, ideally just straight off the PCR, and you should have a single, single 16F sequence from each of those cells. And, um, and then just pick which ones you're interested in doing and either do those individually or pull the ones that you know are supposed to be the same organism and sequence them. Another question, uh, you talked about the area of host DNA contamination metagenomics. Uh-huh. Uh, how do you recommend you know, separating the program from the area of DNA and how much, mm -hmm. you know, how much of uh, what advice do you have for the yeah, I think that um, I think it seems like the uh, Tanya Boyka is really our expert on this. She's both our expert on single cell genomics and on these kind of cell separation techniques. And I think that generally the techniques that seem to have resulted in successful libraries are cell separation level. You know, rather than trying to do some kind of DNA, you know, DNA GC content based thing or something, it's actually getting fresh material of intact cells and doing you know gradient type separations of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And um, you know it's never precise, but we certainly gotten libraries out that were majority um, prokaryotic material. You know, even when there was really quite a lot of host material present. Yeah. Yeah. Following up on that question, when you have communities of both uh, like uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, single cell organisms, do those present any special problems for your metagenomics analysis? I think. Only, we do have, have those kind of projects, um, and I think only in the sense that the eukaryotes, it's very difficult to get, you know, meaningful information if they have large genomes, you know, protists or something, you know, they have such large genomes that the chances you're going to hit on, you know, gene frag, you know, fragments of DNA that are very useful or that you're going to get any kind of assembly out of your metagenome are, are small, but, um, but, you know, we can go ahead and sequence it. I think that, um, 
you know, we've done, I'm trying to think of some of the examples. I mean, we have a rumen project, but we're focusing on transcript sequencing rather than um, metagenome sequencing. So I don't know what the level of, you know, what the level of eukaryotic DNA would be um, relative to prokaryotic. But, but I think um, when it's host, it's pretty clear that it's not what you're interested in. When it's part of the community, then, you know, it, it's fair game. I think you just have to kind of look at the data and decide whether you're going to get something useful out of it. Yeah. Um, I think it would be, but I think the real um, the real challenge with binning is that usually it does not work well with short sequencing. So, but I, I showed that we kind of did this process that often seems backwards to people. They think, why don't you take your reads and bin them, and then assemble the ones that you think belong to the given organism, rather than you know assembling, binning, disassembling, et cetera. And it's because we find that the binning results just don't work very well unless you have a few KB contigs. So with a larger genome, you would need to get a lot of sequence to get big enough contigs to actually bin successfully. But I think in terms of actual uh, you know, oligonucleotide signatures, I think that they're, they're indicative across the phylogenetic tree. Is it more or less successful You know, we haven't. I haven't looked at that closely, but I think that the sequence composition can be quite stable across genomes. You know, whether it's intragenic or not. But I think in eukaryotes, I think that is that is less true, though. I'm, I'm I don't know too much about that. But microbes, I don't think there's a whole lot of sequence content there. You know, composition variation through the genome most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, I was just going to ask about your QC protocols and the rationales behind them, mm -hmm. but these questions are expanding now. Uh -huh. Does JGI have a location where I can go to find a, either papers or, or not necessarily peer review, but mm -hmm. these protocols? And now these questions, it's kind of hints and kinks in mm -hmm. the of what does and does not work. I'm very interested yeah. in, a, in a metagenomics separating out bacteria mm -hmm. and eukaryotes. Is that sort of website or is that? Yeah, I mean, we have definitely have a protocol website that both, um, we have pro protocols, both the protocols that we use at the JGI for production sequence, things so that anybody can see, you know, how we do things, and recommended protocols for collaborators to prepare DNA, um, prepare DNA or prepare libraries or whatever it is that they're doing. And I think for the metagenomes, I don't, I don't know offhand what exactly is up there, but in general, we really try that. You know, if we get something that worked well, we'll really ask, you know, we'll ask the collaborators to send that protocol so that we can post it on the web. And I think if people, even if it's not posted on the web, people contact us and we say, oh, this looks a lot like, you know, some other collaborators project. We'll try to get those people in touch so that they don't have to spend a lot of time reinventing these kinds of techniques. Yeah. Is there any metagenome studies on lignin Sorry, on what kind of? Lignin digesting bacteria. Um, I think that I've heard rumors of lignin digesting bacteria, but as far as as far as our actual genome projects, I think only the fungi. That, you know, we only have lignin, lignin degrading fungi um, in our pipeline. Um, I think up until recently, at least, there was it was believed that that only fungi had that capability. I have heard talk of others, but no, I don't know of any that are actually in the uh, in the process.